Good morning, church. We are going to be continuing our sermon series in the Gospels. We're going to be in John chapter 4 this morning. We're not going to be reading the whole chapter of John. We aren't going to be studying the whole chapter of John chapter 4 either, even though that's the text in question today. I'm going to specifically have a look at verses 16 through to 26. So won't you read with me? You can turn with your Bibles and we can read together. From verse 16 of John chapter 4, it says this. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true, the woman said to him. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem Will you worship the Father? You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Jesus goes on to say, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Verse 26, listen to this. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I'm sure you've all heard this before, that everybody worships something. And that which we worship to a large degree will influence and it will direct the path and the happenings in our daily lives. So today I want to focus exactly on that, worship. There's so much in this text from verses 1 to verses 42. But today I specifically want to have a look at this portion of the conversation, which is the longest conversation we see recorded of Jesus in the New Testament, where he engages this woman at the well. So the the primary focus I want to have a look at today is the topic of worship. All right. So last week, if you missed our sermon, Jesus engaged in a dialogue with Nicodemus, a man, a Jewish man of good standing, a well-educated teacher, a Pharisee who was desperately focused on keeping all aspects of the law. He was a man with a great public presence and with a great public authority, a member of the Sanhedrin. This week, Jesus engages in a dialogue with a woman, a nameless woman, a woman so outcast, so looked down upon, a name isn't even given to her. She was uneducated because of the evident fact that she was female. Her life marked by sin. Five husbands, four of which either divorced her or had died. And her fifth husband now that she was living with, she was not married to. So the rabbis of this time would heavily have disapproved of the fact that she even reached the number five. Because three was the normative cap that you were allowed to have back in the day, in a lifetime. She was publicly shamed because of this. Probably why she was at the well alone, because she was socially despised. Before we go any further, I just want to point this out. We have a socially prominent, well-educated man, an uneducated, a socially estranged woman who both needed Jesus. And he was unbelievably at home, unbelievably caring, compassionate towards the both of them. No matter the status of our lives, no matter our social standing, outcast or socially prominent, Jesus came for all. Amen? So by way of context, um, to see where we're going to be going today, we need a quick little history lesson here. So just note the cultural divide between Jews and Samaritans that Jesus came to bridge out of compassion and love to bring his kingdom, to bring the good news of the gospel to these people. So Jesus approaches the Samaritan woman. Culturally for him, it was a no-go. In Jewish culture, um, Samaritan women were born into a perpetual cycle of uncleanness. So for him to have approached her was a big deal. Jesus' disciples went to get food from the local town where they had passed through. Now, Jews would not have been able to eat with Samaritans. This would have been seen as ritualistic defilement. The fact that his disciples even bought food that Samaritans potentially would have touched itself that would have been defilements as well. So Jesus saw, I mean, sorry, Jews saw Samaritans as children of political rebels, 
as spiritual half-breeds, if we can call it that, whose religion was tainted by various aspects of their incorrect spiritual practices and beliefs. Where does this all originate, you may ask? Well, Israel escapes Egypt and they head towards the Promised Land. The kingdom is divided in two, northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom was captured by Assyria, and as a result, he, the king of Assyria, the Assyrian king, sends some of the Israelites away. Then the Assyrian king decided to send some foreigners during that time back into the northern kingdom of Israel, and as a result, Israel, some foreigners, they had mixed now. So Judah, there was no intermixing. In Israel, there was a mixed nation taking place now. Israel became known as the Samaritans, half Jew, half Gentile. Judah became known as the Jews. So Jews down south saw the area they were in as their promised land, and they didn't want these northern foreigners coming in and claiming that. So this early animosity between the two people groups was because the Samaritans didn't worship the God of the Jews, i.e. the God of Moses. And they had this mixed religion now due to the foreigners that were living among them. So there was this, um, there was this partial Israelite worship mixed with some foreign worship, which ended up um, the Samaritans having a complex, tainted worship. So the Samaritans remained where they were, but the Jews, because they weren't flawless either, were taken captive into Babylon for 70 years. During this time, everything of theirs was destroyed, meaning they got back, when they got back, they had to rebuild everything, the temples, city walls, all of that. So long story short, because of the intermixing between foreigners, different beliefs being brought forward, for hundreds of years there's been this conflict over the fact that, that the Samaritans would worship at their temple, which they believed to be Mount Gerizim, and the Jews were to worship at theirs, which was in Jerusalem. So a reasonable question that we have to ask this morning is this, is that, hey Jesus, why on earth are you speaking to the Samaritan woman? Like, what's the deal? You we understand the cultural and religious divides. Why are you speaking to this Samaritan woman? Now, the beauty in this shows the heart of Jesus and what the good news of the kingdom came to do, i.e. bridge the divide. And we see the most beautiful example in that, in the fact that Jesus bridges the gap that sin created between us and God. So in saying that, let's focus on verses 20 through to 26 this morning. And let's dive into this. The first point that I'd like to make today is this. We worship a person, not a place. We worship a person, not a place. Now, the Samaritan woman sparks a theological debate with Jesus here. A point of tension we've just heard about. She probably did this to divert the attention of her sin that we see exposed in verse 16. Have a look at Deuteronomy 12 five if you can or note this down it says this to seek the place the lord your god would choose from among all the tribes to put his name there for his dwelling both the jews and the samaritans would have recognized this truth but they had differing conclusions as to what it actually meant the place where god was supposed to be worshipped the jews recognized the place spoken of here as jerusalem however the samaritans would disagree their form of Deuteronomy 12.5, because they had developed their own scriptural basis, own Bible, if you can call it that, their own first five books, the Pentateuch, um, then they kept developing these new spiritual truths they thought were truth. It said this, to seek the place the Lord your God has chosen from among all the tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. This led them to believe that Mount Gerizim would be the place of worship spoken of for them. So there's this constant tension taking place now so we have this conversation that has arisen as to where true worship was to take place there were two camps do we worship on mount gerizim or do we worship in jerusalem i'd like to suggest neither and jesus teaches us that here this piece of dialogue begins in a somewhat argumentative note but let's have a look at jesus response here in verses 21 through to 24 look at 21 Jesus pretty much says, Madam, now I use that word because in the text it says woman, and that can come across to you as all well, quite rude. Imagine someone coming along, a male specifically, to a woman saying, hey, woman, listen up. No, that's not what Jesus is saying here. In the original, the better word to use is madam, okay? Madam, believe me when I tell you, he says, that what we are arguing about right now is going to prove to be of no value. Jerusalem, Mount Gerizim, places of worship, it's not going to matter anymore. 
Something greater is about to take place. Have a look at the words there. The hour is coming. In John's gospel, this word hour, um, it means the moment or the hour of Jesus' cross, his death, burial, resurrection, or just the overall events related to his passion, or the situation surrounding the events or the work of the cross. Jesus then makes it clear that forget Mount Gerizim, forget Jerusalem, okay? When he uses the word you in verse 21, he's referring to the Samaritans. When that hour comes, your worship of God won't be confined to either of those two places. He's making this very plain and clear here. Because a time is coming when true worship of the Father will take place, and it won't depend on a place, but it's going to depend on a person. Jesus challenges their existing cultural and religious norms. It's beautiful. Verse 22, Jesus now doesn't necessarily address the location of worship, Mount Gerizim versus Jerusalem. Instead, he says, you Samaritans worship what you don't even know. That's a pretty hard blow for someone who is zealous about what they believe. For someone else to come along, especially the Messiah, whether she knew it or not at the time, she didn't actually, to come across and say, hey, you worship what you don't even know. It's not, about, it, it's, it's not that their view of God that they held made him unknowable. Or they worship something they didn't believe in. He's not addressing the sincerity of their worship. He's saying that the object of their worship was not known to them. That is the issue that is being brought to the surface here. Their focus, the debate, was centered not around a person, but around a place. Think about that. It's, not, it's been centered around a person, not a place. He contrasts this now to the fact that Jesus suggests that, hey, he says, hey, we, the Jews, himself included, he said, we worship what we do know, the God of our fathers. Now, keep in mind that Jewish worship was not flawless. However, they knew the one whom they worshipped. They knew the object of their worship. The last comment here that Jesus makes does not mean that all Jews will be saved necessarily nor does it mean that the promised deliverer i.e the messiah would come from judah even though both the hebrew bible and the samaritan pentateuch make that point you can see that in this conversation or the context the background to what we're seeing here the authority for both the jews and the samaritans lay in their respective bible and jesus comes down he lands on the side of the jews D.A. Carson says this so beautifully. He says, the point that John is trying to get across here is that this isn't basing itself on racial bias or religion, but in a firm conviction that salvation for Jews and Gentiles lies in the Messiah that is announced by the Jewish scriptures, a Messiah whose claims cannot be ignored. Verse 23 and 24. God appointed the Jewish people group to the privilege of and responsibility to pass on the truths of God in the Old Testament. I kind of look at that and I hear that truth and I think about ourselves today, the Great Commission. You and I have been given the responsibility to pass on the truths of God in the world that we are in today. Before Jesus' ministry, the message of salvation as a whole, that message was conveyed through the Jews, God's people. However, the time was not only coming, but it come when true worship would take place in and through the person of Jesus. True worship can only take place in and through the, worship, the person of Jesus, who himself was the true temple. So all these other temples don't matter. They didn't matter anymore. He himself, John 2, verse 19 to 22, he himself was the true temple. Jesus himself is the resurrection and the life, John 11, verse 25. Jesus on the cross, his work there was the turning point. Jesus insists that true worshippers are not identified by a place of worship, or shrines, or idols, or even a specific people group. That's not what identifies true worshippers. They are identified by their worship of the Father in spirit and truth. In this context, the word spirit characterizes what God is like. In the same way that human flesh characterizes what we are like. By saying this, that God is spirit, it also means that God is obviously invisible, 
as we know. He is divine as opposed to human. He is life-giving and he is unknowable to human beings unless he chooses to reveal himself to them. And God has chosen to reveal himself to human beings. Praise the Lord for that. If we look at some of his characteristics, God is light. He's revealed himself through his son, Jesus, the light of the world for all to see and follow. God is love personified in and through the person and work of Jesus on the cross. God is spirit. These are ways in which God has revealed himself to us through his son. So God has indeed revealed himself to us, which is a beautiful truth to hold on to. Through his word, which is an expression of who he is. That's why this Bible, we should never, ever stop reading, studying, loving, cherishing our Bibles. His word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the means through which we as humans, created beings, can know God fully. Through Jesus, we can receive the Holy Spirit. And it is once we have been born of the Spirit that we can now know and worship God truly in spirit and truth. So what does it mean? What does it mean to worship God in spirit and truth? Well, D.A. Carson so aptly answers this question. He says it should be essentially God-centered, made possible by the gift of the Holy Spirit and a personal knowledge of and conformity to God's Word made flesh, the one who was God's truth, the final exposition and fulfillment of God and His saving purposes, i.e. Jesus. So true worship is to be directed toward and centered in a person, not a place. The conversation between the Jews and the Samaritans was now made void because the one in whom their worship should lie had now arrived. We worship a person, not a place. Now, when speaking about worship, with all things in life, there are things that can hinder us from worshiping effectively. Things that can stop us from fully worshiping God with our whole entire hearts. And my second point this morning I'd like to make is this. Worship impediments. Worship impediments. Now, an impediment is this. It's a hindrance or an obstruction in doing something. Think about some things, some impediments or hindrances that would come to our mind. Think about a stutter that would stop somebody from communicating in the way that they want to communicate. Or poor eyesight could stop somebody from achieving what they want to achieve because of their poor eyesight. Or think about different languages and different people groups in different countries, us going there, they, them coming here. Language barriers can be an impediment. Or your car breaking down when you're on your way to some sort of event, you want to get there, but you can't because your car's just broken down. Or visas or quarantine restrictions stopping you from seeing friends and family all over the world because of the virus we're currently facing. These are all things, and the list can go on, that can stop us from reaching a desired end goal. Think about worship in the church today. Worship in song, worship in preaching, worship in practice, worship in gathering, the entirety of worship. In all different aspects of the collective word, something we have all encountered are these hindrances. They are evident stumbling blocks, divisions, and hindrances that could possibly affect true worship. Things that we should never allow to affect it in the first place. Even in this dialogue between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, we see a debate about worship taking place. And with that, we see some hindrances, impediments of worship. Listen to what she says. She says, Our fathers worshipped here, but your fathers say their place of worship is the correct place. There's this division, this argument that is taking place is about what true worship should look like. So here are some impediments, some hindrances, some things that I believe we need to be aware of in the modern day church that could possibly affect our worship of God. Your worship, my worship. It could affect our worship of God. The first one is this. Sin and distraction sin and distraction look at the Samaritan woman until the sin in her life was addressed and the practices that she was engaging in were rectified true worship could not take place Jesus pointed out the issue with her husbands and she was made aware of this okay look at Israel throughout the Old Testament there was this incorrect assumption that if they had all the external aspects of worship done right God would be pleased 
Amos 5, 22 to 24 says this, Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of your fat and animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from, from me the noise of your songs, the melody of your harps. I will not listen. But let justice, <coughs> excuse me, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Now this text doesn't mean that worship is exclusively for perfect people. That's not the case. But it is for people who desire to worship God with a sincere heart committed to living in obedience to Jesus. Worship is, be, is to be engaged in with total humility and dependence on the person of Jesus. By way of application, I'd like to set a challenge before you this morning when speaking about worship. Not just worship in song or um, here gathering at church, but worship as an entirety of our life. I want to ask you a question. Is there some sin, a distraction, some hidden sin, some incorrect practice that you're engaging in that is hindering you from worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords wholeheartedly and devotedly? Something that is dividing your heart between, hey, this incorrect practice as a distraction and me fully worshiping the Lord. If there is something, I want to encourage you, let's deal with that. Okay, address those things, those stumbling blocks in your life. And we see the beauty on the back end of that. From verse 16, we see the Samaritan woman's sin is exposed by Jesus. As he knew her sin already. Side note, Jesus knows the intricacies of our hearts, minds, our bodies, and our souls. There's nothing that can remain hidden from the person of Jesus. She then realizes the truth of who Jesus was, then goes on to tell others about who he was, resulting in a testimony bringing others to the Lord because he exposed and dealt with the sin. So you see, it's when we fully let go of pre-existing sin, distractions, hindrances, and we repent of that, that we can fully devote ourselves to the worship of Jesus in our lives. We have to let go of sin and distraction and embark on a journey of untainted, undefiled worship to God. 1 John 1 verse 9 says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess, repent, then worship the Lord with all your heart. Address the sin, then continue to worship Him. And the beautiful thing is you don't have to do this alone. God is the one who can help you. He is the one that enables us and inspires us to address these things in our lives. The second hindrance or impediment to worship is this, incorrect priorities, incorrect priorities. Think about the Jews and the Samaritans' conflict here. They were locked in this age-old argument as to where worship was supposed to effectively take place. This occupied their attention to the point where this Messiah that for both parties had been speaking of, who was coming, was in fact in their midst, right? And he was standing right in front of her, yet she didn't even know it. So their focus lay in the procedures of worship and the place of worship instead of the one in whom our hearts need to be worshipping. Okay? So think about this in the churches today. Right? We found ourselves in a, an extremely familiar and a similar position. There's so often this debate in churches about worship styles. This whole old versus new. It shouldn't even be a question. If the worship is God-honoring and Bible-centered, let's do it. Good to go. Do we raise our hands the whole way, like a, or, 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 do we, or do we only raise them halfway, or do we raise them not at all? Okay, Questions like that. Should worship be liturgical or spontaneous? Should worship be led by a single specific person or a whole choir of people? Should we, address, should we dress a certain way when coming to worship, or can we come to worship feeling comfortable around the person of God? So to a large extent, worship in the modern day church has become not about the person, but the place. And it's a sad truth I bet you could all agree with. Bruce Mill makes the point that when these kinds of things become the focus of our worship, instead of the creator of our worship remaining the focus, we slide into the trap of focusing too much on form rather than content. Now by form, I mean this, hands raised, dress code, worship style, music style, type of Sunday our worship needs to look like versus the content 
which needs to be Jesus and Him crucified, nothing else. So we need to realize that both sides of the spectrum and things um, spoken of here can be brought across in both a negative and a positive way with regards to worship, depending on how far we take it. So the outward forms of worship that we see are simply a matter of taste and preference, and that's what they should remain. Bruce Mill once again says, one of the implications of the fact that God is spirit is that, um, is that no form can ever be made the absolute one. No worship form can ever be or will ever meet every need. If it did, it would detract from the glory that is God's alone. The true priority is the content of worship. A worship from the heart which truly exalts God. The third impediment is this, wrong ideas of God. I was doing a worship devotion and Matt Redman quoted this. He says, the revelation of God is the fuel and fire of our worship. You see, if our idea about who God is and what our relation to, relationship to Him entails is incorrect, it affects our worship and of Him negatively. Our worship of God is first preceded by a true and sincere revelation of who God is in and through His Word, ultimately in and through the person of Jesus. God, His Word, His Son, must be the lens through which we worship. Therefore, a sincere, correct knowledge of God will result in a sincere, correct, radiant, and obedient, dependent worship on God. So therefore, our worship of Him must be anchored in what we know about Him and His Word, in saying that the focus is to be hinged around the worship that is Bible-centered, Okay, and Jesus-centered. Our worship should be Jesus-centered. Why? Because ultimately, He is at the heart of all biblical writings. He is the truth embodied. It must be Jesus-centered because He is the one, the only one, through which the Holy Spirit is attainable. So worship in anything else, through anything else, isn't worship at all. I'd like to land by asking, why do we worship? What motivates us? What incentivizes us to worship? With our whole entire lives. We find, the, we find the answer here. Jesus says, when the true worshipers, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. A time is coming when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Because the Father is seeking such people to worship him. If there's any sort of encouragement I can give you today as to why we need to worship, it's this. Our worship matters to God. And how do we know this? John 3, 16. God gave His only Son to take the sin of the world upon our shoulders, to die on the cross, to defeat death and sin, and rise again, to ascend to heaven, so that whoever believes in Him, takes the blame for their sins, turns from their sins, trusts in Jesus, can have relationship with the Father that is made possible, that, that was first primarily impossible because of sin. And when we do this, we engage in a life of worship to God through Jesus, and this matters to God untainted, unhindered, sincere, wholehearted worship matters to God. So I want to encourage you all this morning, church, that we don't worship a place. Our worship is centered and devoted around a person, not a place. Are there any hindrances, impediments, speed humps in your faith walk that are stopping you from wholeheartedly worshiping God? If so, let's deal with those. All right, God bless you. Have an amazing week. Cheers.